Hello, good morning, uh, and you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. I'm Eamon, and I'm from the Nair Centre, and I'm joined today by Daniel from the South African Astronomical Observatory. And we will be looking at the wonders of South African astronomy from a both historical and modern perspectives. So just before I hand you over to Daniel, there are a few simple rules as this is a webinar. As it is a webinar, you can view and hear us, but we can't hear and see you. If you have any questions or technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat. Get your teacher to pop them into the chat box, which is in the right-hand side of the screen. We have allowed some time at the end of the session to answer the questions, so we might not address them as we go through the stream, but as soon as we get to the end, we will uh, take some time and try and get back to you in as much detail as possible. So I'm now going to hand you over to Daniel, who will start the presentation. Thank you, Eamon. Uh, good morning, everyone, from a very hot and sunny South Africa. I'll try not to make you too jealous. Um, so, uh, as Eamon said, I'll be giving you a journey through uh, South African astronomy uh, from a very early indigenous astronomy to some of the very exciting developments that are, uh, that are happening here in the country and on the continent. But firstly, uh, who am I? Uh, so, my name is Daniel Kanema, as uh, I've said. I am based at the South African Astronomical Observatory, and I'm a, a professional astronomer. So I studied my PhD and did a, a few subsequent postdocs before being employed here at the at the Astronomical Observatory. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the observatory and the work we do uh, over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, so just to give you a brief overview of the talk, uh, I will be giving you you know, uh, an overview of astronomy and South Africa's role from the ancient uh, times uh, through to the modern uh, te telescopes and technology we have at the moment. Uh, we'll look at some of those telescopes, uh, namely the Southern African Large Telescope, or SALT, uh, and the very advanced Meerkat Radio Telescope, uh, and a few other instruments along the way. And then I'd like to give you an overview of, of some of the, the, the work that is being done uh, more peripheral to astronomy research uh, using astronomy for development. So to inspire education and drive socioeconomic development and, um, and grow international collaborations. So that's a little overview of the, the presentation. Um, and firstly, we should start with what is astronomy? I'm sure many of you know what astronomy is or have an idea, uh, but basically what we're doing is looking at the universe uh, both on near scales and very, very far away, and trying to work out how it works, where it came from, where it's going, uh, and the, the underlying physics of the universe. So here at the observatory in, in Cape Town, um, and our, uh, we work on many different fields within astronomy from the very small scales, and these are small scales astronomically speaking, not, <laughs> not small scales as you would uh, picture them. But uh, so things like asteroids, uh, meteorites, uh, we are tracking asteroids and meteors as they come into the Earth uh, and crash in. Uh, also asteroids and dwarf planets traveling around in our solar system, uh, planets around other stars or exoplanets. Uh, and then we look at stars themselves. So we look at different types of stars, pulsating stars, giant stars, dwarf stars, uh, they come in all sizes and colors. And then on even larger scales, we study galaxies. So these are collections of billions of stars. Uh, and the, the current estimate is that there are about 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. So that's two with 12 zeros at the end of it, um, more than you could possibly imagine. Uh, and each of those with billions of stars and planets. Uh, so that's the sort of scale of the universe we're looking at. Uh, and we're trying to understand where this came from and our place in the universe. So um, by way of example, this is a stunning uh, shot of a very, very small patch of sky, you know, just a sort of the, the, the head of a pin at arm's length up in the sky. And what you're seeing here is primarily galaxies. There are a few stars. The stars are there with the spikes. This is from the James Webb Space Telescope, which you have probably heard about, a huge six and a half meter telescope, which is up in space and taking incredible um, photographs and, and data 
for us as astronomers. But what you can see in this tiny little patch of sky is just hundreds and hundreds of galaxies. And, and that's what we, wanna, we want to look at um, and study and work out where we came from, where our galaxy came from, our star, the sun, um, and our planets. So we can do that in many different ways, um, and I'll get into that in a moment. But this sort of relationship with the stars is something which has been, uh, you know, with us as humans since the dawn of humanity. So as I'm sure you have, um, if you've been outside on a clear night and particularly in a dark space, so away from city lights and, uh, you know, light pollution, looking up at the stars is an incredible experience. Uh, it can be quite uh, spiritually moving. Uh, you can, you know, see the, the scale and the awe uh, of, of the universe, which is what, you know, inspires us as astronomers to study and understand it. And the same was true for the indigenous people of Africa and Southern Africa. And uh, we have unfortunately lost a lot of that understanding, that knowledge, um, but some of it does remain. And uh, we have done uh, quite a lot of work here at the observatory over the, over the years to try and keep these stories of the stars alive. Uh, we have worked on uh, doing research, both with uh, people who are still aware of these stories, traveling to uh, indigenous communities, um, and recording their stories of the night sky, but then also going through archival information and trying to revive these stories and, and, and share them. So that when we are doing things like outreach, um, talks like this, we are able to tell more than just the, the story of the science, but we can also tell the story of the people, of their relationship with the stars um, and the skies. Um, over the, the many, many generations of humanity. So one particular project which we, we did, which was really, really fun um, in the last little while, uh, was make a planetarium film, which was called Sida Tswatswas, uh, which is a, a, a Khoiko Gowab, which is a, a, an indigenous language. Um, so it's a Khoiko Gowab word for our beginning. And in this, we explore exactly uh, what I've been talking about. So uh, the indigenous people's relationship with the stars, how those stories have been lost uh, in the current uh, you know, education system and through our, our past and our history, uh, and how we can recover them. So we travel through uh, the, the story with this character who you can see here, whose name is Patat. Um, which means potato. Um, he's an excellent character. Um, and he, you know, talks us through his relationship with the stars and tells us the story of how the jackal, uh, which is a very small, uh, you know, dog-like creature um, that we get in Africa, um, how he got his black back. So the jackal has a black back. And we, we animate that story. So we try and celebrate this culture and tell this story in the planetarium film. Um, I'll, I won't be able to do the same service to the story as uh, the film does, but in summary, uh, the jackal falls in love with the sun uh, and he carries the sun on his back uh, he, for, for many, many days. And, and eventually he gets so burnt and so hot that he needs to find a way uh, to get rid of her and get him get her off his back and he does this by uh, scrambling under a, a bush and scraping her off the back um, or off his back and from that he has this burnt and uh, gray back which he he keeps to this day uh, so that was one of the the wonderful stories which we we discovered and managed to to share and there are many more and we've made a, a series of animations uh, and we've also done a, a huge amount of work here in Cape Town and in our visitor center in Sutherland, which I'll speak about in a moment, uh, to try and restore and share these, these stories. Uh, it's incredibly um, powerful to be able to speak to, to people uh, about stories which feel close and uh, you know, familiar to them, 
rather than only telling stories, you know, from different cultures and, uh, you know, with with animals, which maybe they, they aren't familiar with uh, and those sorts of things. So, you know, everyone in, in Africa has probably seen a jackal or at least heard it at night. Uh, and that, that means you, you know, you can feel a little bit closer to the stars and closer to these stories. On, on that, we, we did a, a huge amount of work too on trying to uh, revive some African constellations. Uh, and we did that by trawling through some archival information from over 150 years ago, uh, where some individuals were recorded uh, describing these constellations in the night sky. Uh, they gave simple descriptions of where they were in the night sky back in the 1870s on a particular night. Um, and us, uh, along with uh, some artists, managed to go back with planetarium software and, and picture and sort of identify where in the sky these constellations they were describing were, uh, and then working with artists from, from the community uh, these days reimagine these constellations uh, so and then now we have uh, added these constellations to the ceiling of our visitor center uh, here in Cape Town and you can see a picture of one of them with the the stars shining through the back they're backlit with LEDs um, and in this case the constellation is the Irland uh, which is a very large antelope uh, which is was in, an incredibly powerful animal and quite sacred to the, the indigenous people, the Khoi and San of Southern Africa. Uh, so that is another way in which we are trying to make, uh, you know, not just revive and, um, and, 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 yeah, keep, keep alive these stories, but, um, but also to engage people uh, and uh, try and have them feel at home and comfortable um, rather than having constellations which don't uh, necessarily feel very comfortable for them. For example, we have a couple of things in, in, in the, the Southern Hemisphere, which, you know, you may not be aware of if you haven't traveled to the Southern Hemisphere, but something like Orion, the Orion constellation, is always a tricky one to explain uh, because it's upside down if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. And when you're trying to explain it to a child, the first, the first thing they say is, why is it upside down? Um, so, uh, and that's because it was a, a Northern Hemisphere constellation and has now been uh, taken to the, to the Southern Hemisphere. So th that is uh, a lot of the work we're doing in terms of these, these, th this African star law. And um, there are many more cultures in, in Southern Africa and Africa beyond the Khoi and San. Um, and this is an ongoing project with, with many different people working on, on many different aspects. Um, it's obviously very time consuming, but also very exciting uh, and very rewarding uh, way for us to, to explore and, and share this, this incredible uh, news and stories. So uh, back to formal astronomy. So um, as I said at the beginning, I'm based at the South African Astronomical Observatory. The South African Astronomical Observatory is in Cape Town, South Africa, at the very southern tip of, of Africa. And the uh, Cape Town itself, or the Cape Province, was a British colony um, about 200 years ago. And the, the, the British Admiralty built this observatory uh, in 1820, uh, primarily to keep time for the ships who were passing through the, the, the Cape Town Harbour. Uh, and uh, they needed very accurate timekeeping uh, in order to set their clocks so that they could navigate. Um, I will not go into to details of, of celestial navigation, but suffice to say that you could use the stars to very accurately calibrate your clocks. Um, and then for a ship to have a clock which is accurately calibrated meant that they could tell their longitude. Without such a clock, they wouldn't really know how far east or west they were. So that was why the observatory was established uh, just over 200 years ago. And from there, it, it has uh, changed and evolved with many telescopes being built and many discoveries being made. Um, and, and these days, 
uh, it is still here. Um, this is just outside my window, and uh, the observatory is now, um, you know, uh, 204 years old and occupied by uh, hundreds of, of staff members, um, both here and at our observing site in Sutherland, which I'll show you in a moment. But uh, over those years, the, the observatory has been um, pivotal to many aspects of science and astronomy. Uh, the first measurement of the distance to a star was made from here in Cape Town. Um, and the, uh, the first uh, survey of the southern sky was also made from the Cape. So, you know, many of the, uh, many of the, the southern constellations were identified and described here, obviously from a Western perspective, uh, but described and mapped for the first time from the Western Cape. Um, you can see, I see Patrick posted a, a, a question on the, on the chat, which I'll answer immediately because it's appropriate. Um, you can see that even when I took this photo, unfortunately, it was cloudy. Um, Cape Town is not a wonderful site for, for astronomy. It was obviously convenient, um, close to the harbour uh, and on a very small hill. Uh, and yes, in those days, uh, 200 years ago, uh, the constellations and stars would have been visible to the naked eye. There wouldn't have been pollution. There wouldn't have been uh, light pollution. Uh, but the you know the, the weather was still not great. We have horrible wind in Cape Town, uh, and then also the, our winter is is very very cloudy. Uh, so uh, the, the the observing conditions weren't wonderful, um, but they weren't terrible. But then over the years, uh, as as the Cape Town has grown, and now the Cape Town. Um, metropolitan houses, uh, you know, about 5 million people. So it's a huge city and uh, the, it's very hard to see more than, you know, 200 stars or so from, from our observatory in Cape Town, uh, which takes us to our next slide. So in 1972, uh, when the situation became unbearable, uh, we moved our observing and research telescopes to Sutherland, um, which is a, a small town uh, 400 kilometers away from Cape Town in the, the very central area of South Africa. And there we are at altitude, so at 1800 meters above sea level, which means there's less atmosphere to, for us to look through, less air, uh, which is a, a good thing for us as astronomers. Uh, as you can see in this picture, it's incredibly dry. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, clear nights. I think we get about 330 clear nights a year. Um, and also it's very, very dark. So there are, uh, th the nearest town is Sutherland itself, which is about 20 kilometers away. Uh, and then this is our observatory site here where everything, uh, including all the outdoor lights and everything are very carefully controlled. There are in fact no outdoor lights. Uh, so it's an incredibly dark uh, site. Uh, and as telescopes have got better and better, that's become more and more uh, necessary. So, you know, we, we have very sensitive instruments which can are, are picking up very small numbers of photons. So we require a, a, a very, very uh, dark uh, and high sight. So uh, our, our telescopes up in Sutherland, uh, there are about 25 telescopes now uh, up in Sutherland of various sizes. Uh, and I like to think of it as a rugby team or a football team. Um, they all have a valuable role to play. It's not just the biggest ones that you're after. Uh, they have different specialities in terms of what they can see, what they're observing, um, and uh, how wide a field of view. So can they see the whole sky and multiple times a night, or can they just look at something really, really far away for a long time? So all of these telescopes work together uh, to answer the questions we're after. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we host telescopes, not just for ourselves, but for institutes around the world. So some of those telescopes are the South African Astronomical Observatories, um, including the Southern African Large Telescope, which I'll, I'll show in a moment. Uh, but we also have telescopes from around the world, from, from Japan, from the US uh, and Germany and the UK. So we, we host uh, various telescopes um, so that astronomers can do their, their research. Uh, it's probably also worth noting that the astronomers no longer need to travel to Sutherland to do any observing. 
all of these telescopes are remotely operable. Um, you can log on on your laptop from anywhere in the world and control them uh, and get your data. Uh, and then uh, some of them now are even one step beyond that where they are what we call robo robotic. So they're fully robotic, which means that you don't have to even be awake. <laughs> they will run all of their observations through the night on their own. Um, you basically give them a list of what you want to observe uh, and they will do that for you. So uh, some people would say we're putting ourselves out of a job, but... <laughs> um, but at least we, um, you know, we have more data to play with, which is what we really, really want. Uh, so, you know, these telescopes, um, as I said, have have various skills and uh, and specialities. Um, so, one of them, uh, one of our our smaller telescopes called Lacerdi, was involved in a very, very exciting uh, um, uh, piece of research uh, just over a year ago. You may have heard about it, um, the DART mission, where the NASA sent this uh, this um, probe to crash into an asteroid to see whether they could deflect it, uh, and they successfully did deflect it. Uh, it wasn't going to hit Earth anyway, but they decided to send a, pro a probe just as a proof proof of concept to see whether, if we needed to deflect an asteroid, uh, we would be able to was very, very successful. So we can deflect asteroids, which is nice to know. Um, but from from a Cape Town and well, from a, an SAO perspective, it was very exciting because the moment of the, the impact was directly over South Africa at that time. So we were the only ones who, who had telescopes who could actually observe it. And what you can see in the center here is, is that impact. There's a puff of, of dust and rock um, to the left of the asteroid, which is placed in the middle there. So that bright spot is the asteroid in the middle, um, and the, the cloud of, of dust and debris is, is the impact. So that was a very, very exciting thing we were involved in recently with one of our smaller telescopes. And, uh, you know, like I said, we are working with, with astronomers all around the world, um, working on various different, uh, you know, scales of the universe and, and discoveries. So I've mentioned the Southern African Large Telescope. So the Southern African Large Telescope, uh, or SALT, is uh, the fourth largest optical telescope in the world. Uh, as you can see here, it's you know six stories tall. Uh, it's a 10 meter class telescope, uh, and it was built in with the South African government in collaboration with various institutes around the world, including a consortium in the UK, uh, but then also partners in Poland. Uh, and uh, in the US and it was completed in 2005 uh, so it is coming on 20 years old now uh, but is still an absolutely incredible instrument um, you can see here the the mirrors um, this is 10 meters across each of those hexagonal mirrors is one meter across so if you can imagine how big that that instrument is uh, it's it's an absolutely huge telescope and the reason we need such a big telescope um, is, you know, we, we want to collect as many photons or any, many little, uh, as, as much light as possible. So essentially what we're looking at is a, a light bucket. Um, it's a, it's a, bucket of, a bucket where we're collecting photons. Uh, and the bigger your bucket, the more photons you can collect, collect which means the fainter the object you can see. Uh, I like to think of it like your eye, your pupil, um, you know, your pupil dilates when you go into a dark room to let in more light. Um, cats and owls have much bigger pupils, which means they can see in much less light. Uh, and then for salt, we have a, a 10 meter pupil, which means we can find very, very faint objects very, very far away. And then once we've collected that light, then what we do with it is the really, really exciting part. So with SALT, it is primarily a spectrometer. Um, and a spectrometer essentially takes that light and sends it through a series of, of prisms and gratings, and it splits it up into all of its different wavelengths. So, uh, it, and then very, very high resolution. And what you can do then is, like in this example, if you're looking at an exploding star, uh, you can look at the light split up uh, across all of the different wavelengths 
And from that, you can learn a huge amount uh, about the object you're looking at. You can work out what gases are in it. Uh, you can work out their concentrations, so how much of each gas, uh, the temperatures, the speed it's moving, whether it's rotating, whether it's moving you know, f f f towards or away from us. Um, and all of this just by collecting the photons um, and splitting up the, the, the light into all of its wavelengths. So SALT is, is very, very good at this. Um, it is, a, it is a, one of the best spectrometers in the world um, and uh, has had some excellent results um, and some very exciting discoveries. Um, one of the most exciting in my time, um, actually one of the most exciting full stop, was uh, in 2017 when two neutron stars merged. So neutron stars are very, very dense objects. So they are uh, about the same mass as our sun. So it's a, it's a star of the mass of our sun, but it's compressed into a space about 12 kilometers across. So, you know, a very, very small area for so much mass. Uh, and then when two of these things collide, they make the whole of space and time ripple. Um, so this was an object, uh, an event that was picked up by the gravitational wave observatories. Um, which I, I certainly won't go into today. Um, but because uh, this was not merging black holes, but neutron stars, uh, there was light associated with the event. So electromagnetic radiation in addition to the gravitational waves. And this was the first time this was ever observed, and it's the only time still. So this was in 2017, and we haven't observed another one yet, again um, yet. And SALT, the Southern African Large Telescope, was the first uh, large telescope to get a spectrum. So as I said, it's a, it's a very good spectrometer. Um, and the SALT managed to get a spectrum of, of the event uh, and, and confirm that it was actually this uh, merging neutron stars. So that was very, very exciting uh, and you know, uh, led to, to a lot of media and press um, and um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a life-changing event. Um, so I've talked a lot about our telescopes um, at the observatory. We are primarily an optical observatory, so we're looking in visible light. Uh, but there is light across the spectrum, across the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, which these telescopes with their mirrors and uh, spectrometers can't see. So SALT and all of our other telescopes are observing in this tiny little band uh, of visible light um, where, you know, the rainbow exists. But as astronomers, we want to collect photons from as many different wavelengths as possible because we want to learn as much as possible. So if we're just looking invisible, we're essentially just looking at one of the puzzle pieces, uh, whereas there's all these other puzzle pieces which we can collect um, and try and piece together a much more complete uh, understanding of the objects we're looking at, whether that is stars or galaxies or, uh, you know, the distant universe. So uh, we need to build telescopes that can observe in all these other wavelengths uh, and try and combine those results. Uh, and that's something called multi-wavelength astronomy. So essentially what you're doing um, is you're taking light, which you can see coming from the top, you're passing it through um, a spectrometer or prism or something um, to get the optical light. Um, but then if you want to collect some of the other ray, other wavelengths, you need to build other telescopes. So from the left to the right, you can see there's gamma ray telescopes up in space, X-ray telescopes, ultraviolet telescopes, and all of those need to be placed in space because our atmosphere uh, protects us from ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma rays, which is a very fortunate thing. Uh, because, you know, otherwise we would be cooked. But, <laughs> but uh, for an astronomer, we want, to, we want to collect that light. So we need to send a, uh, an instrument up into space to collect it before it hits the atmosphere. Um, optical does pass through, as we know, um, and infrared does not. So again, we need to send uh, telescopes up into space to collect the infrared. Uh, and then finally, radio light. Um, passes into our atmosphere quite easily, so then we can build large radio telescopes. And by doing this, uh, we can collect all the different puzzle pieces uh, that make up an object. So most of these objects are emitting 
in all of these different wavelengths, depending on how energetic they are. Um, and the more we can collect, the better. Uh, and then essentially what we get is the images of the same object, but it's looking slightly different. So you can see here is uh, something called a nebula, um, a planetary nebula. Uh, it's uh, the remnant of an exploded star. Uh, and you can look at it in X-ray, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and radio. Uh, and when you combine all of those wavelengths, you get this beautiful picture uh, of what the, the, the planetary nebula looks like. And you can piece together what happened in terms of the explosion, where the energetic gas is, um, and, and you can do this for, for many, many objects. So, you know, not just for nebulae, um, but you can do this for entire galaxies, uh, clusters of galaxies, and then obviously um, on smaller scales for, for stars. So multi-wavelength astronomy is is essentially all um, uh, all astronomy, um, but uh, these days because uh, you know uh, we, we're always working with with other instruments to try and get a more complete picture. I'll go back to this slide just to answer uh, Tieran's. Uh, question, which was, uh, do radio telescopes record sound rather than light? Um, and no. Uh, so radio waves are uh, a form of light. Um, all of the, the wavelengths which you can see here on this, uh, this slide are, are light. So light comes uh, in the form of photons, uh, which are small light particles, but light also behaves like a wave. Um, so it has uh, a, a wavelength. Um, and it is all just different wavelengths or frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, which is uh, photons. Sound is something different. So sound is a, a vibration which is traveling through some substrate. So, you know, uh, the sound coming out of my voice and going into the microphone, I'm essentially vibrating my vocal cords, which are vibrating the air, which is vibrating the inside of the microphone um, and the, the electronic equipment in there is measuring that vibration and converting it into uh, uh, information. Um, and that gets passed to you uh, and your speaker is vibrating, which is vibrating the air, which then vibrates your eardrum. So that is, uh, there isn't a particle of sound traveling. There isn't a, a wave of sound there is this vibration which is passing through the medium. Uh, and that's the same for all sound. Um, and uh, that means that sound doesn't pass through space because there isn't enough matter uh, to, to pass through. Um, but uh, uh, the, the confusion with radio comes in because we listen to the radio. Um, but uh, re the reason it's called radio is because the way it's transmitted is through large towers, which are radio uh, emitters and receivers. Uh, and that's because radio waves travel very, very well uh, over very, very long distances. So if you want to send a signal from one side of the country to another, uh, you want to use radio waves and radio light for that. I hope that answers your question. It's a common misconception. Um, so this is what a radio telescope looks like. Uh, right on cue. Um, this is the Meerkat radio telescope. So this was a South African project which was completed uh, in 2018. Uh, and it at the moment is the largest and most powerful radio telescope in the world. Uh, these dishes, which you can see here, there are 64 of them uh, in the, the, the Karoo of South Africa. So inside our, our, our the center of South Africa, which is a, a desert region. Uh, and each of these telescopes is about 15 meters tall. Uh, the dish is about 13 meters across. So you can imagine how big they are. Uh, and there are 64 of them all working together. And because of the wavelength of radio light, you have to build uh, something which is a little bit different to uh, an optical telescope. You know, an optical telescope essentially has a mirror. A mirror can reflect radio, uh, reflect optical light but given because of the wavelength of a radio wave, it would pass directly through a mirror. Um, so you need something a little bit bigger to reflect the radio light and collect it. Uh, and we do this using radio telescopes um, and combine 
the signal from all 64 dishes into one signal um, and take some some absolutely incredible images like this. Um, so now we're looking at very, very hot gas, which is around the black hole uh, at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. So there is a black hole at the center of, of uh, all galaxies, um, and they are huge, so hundreds of millions of times the mass of our sun, uh, which make them very, very energetic uh, and makes for a very hot and dynamic area. Uh, and we can observe this in, in radio wavelengths. So you can see here the, the hot gas around the, the Milky Way um, uh, black hole, uh, and you can see these filaments and little puffs of, of very, very hot gas from uh, various objects and stars going supernova uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, again, like I, I mentioned before, by looking in different wavelengths, we can see completely different things. Uh, this would not be possible uh, in optical. You wouldn't be able to to probe this close to the, to the black hole uh, because there would have been a lot of light pollution from other stars and dust and things which are obscuring our view. Um, and the Meerkat uh, radio telescope, uh, as I said, is the most powerful radio telescope at the moment, uh, but it is just a precursor to an even larger telescope uh, called the Square Kilometer Array, which is currently under construction. Uh, the first dish arrived in, in, in South Africa just a week ago uh, and is being put up. Uh, they will be adding uh, an additional 130 dishes to the, the Meerkat Array to make by far the biggest radio telescope in the world um, and that will be able to probe uh, you know the, the very early universe in areas which we've we've never even dreamed of exploring up until now um, there are two parts to the square kilometer array though uh, the second part which you can see on the right uh, is this uh, array of what look like uh, little christmas trees little metal christmas trees um, or if you're familiar with old TV antenna, um, that's essentially what they are. So they're low frequency antenna picking up a different wavelength of radio light. And that telescope will be based in Western Australia. Um, and that is also under construction at the moment. So, so these two telescopes will be combined into the square kilometer array. Um, and they are another example of multi-wavelength astronomy because they are observing in slightly different wavelengths. Um, but working uh, together. So the SKA um, is a very, very exciting project and it will be, uh, as I said, probing the very beginnings of our universe um, and some of the, the real extreme uh, objects in, in, the, in the universe and, and trying to push the boundaries of our understanding. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned that I wanted to, to give a little overview of some of the, the other impacts of astronomy and some of the other things we're passionate about. Um, and the astronomy is an incredible tool uh, for inspiring uh, the next generation uh, because, you know, everybody has some relationship with the stars uh, and they are very exciting. And then obviously we get amazing pictures. <laughs> so we always, uh, we always um, get a lot of jealousy from other science fields because we have things like Hubble and James Webb, which are, are just beaming us um, beautiful pictures, we, which we can use for outreach. Um, thank you for your question, Sam. I think I'll answer that one at the end, if that's okay. So um, in terms of the, the other impacts of astronomy, uh, we spend a, a huge amount of our time and energy uh, in education, so visiting schools um, and uh, having learners visit us um, and trying to drive socioeconomic development in the areas we work in um, and, and public involvement and engagement in science. Um, the observatory here in Cape Town reaches about 30,000 learners a year um, and 500 teachers. Uh, we do teacher training, so we train teachers in, in the curriculum, um, the astronomy curriculum, uh, so that they can then pass those learnings on to, to their students. Um, and we also have a very active job shadowing program uh, where we host students um, who are in their, their final or, or second from, from final year at school. Uh, and we, we don't just show them astronomy um, or astronomy research jobs, but all of the other jobs which are uh, attached to it. Here at the observatory, we have about 150 staff members 
uh, of which only about 30 are professional astronomers. So we have a, a very strong engineering team. Um, we have electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, um, instrument scientists, um, fiber lab. So we, you know, we build all of our own telescopes. You can't buy uh, telescopes off Amazon um, or instruments. So we, we need to manufacture these ourselves. So we have a very advanced workshop. Um, and then obviously there's a huge amount of maintenance and, and IT and data um, uh, that we have to deal with too. So uh, we, we try to highlight all of these uh, adjacent jobs uh, which are which are re relevant and necessary for for astronomical research. Um, we also, uh, you know, in terms of South Africa and and the global impact, um, uh, I've mentioned already. Like we host other uh, other um, telescopes in in South Af in South Africa from from around the world, uh, but South Africa really has over the last twenty or thirty years become. A, a leader in in Africa and actually in the world. So Meerkat is is the most powerful radio telescope in the world, and we're getting the, the square kilometer array, and that's a, a testament to the to the huge uh, investment that the South African government and the South African people have put into uh, astronomy. Um, we're involved in in huge global project projects, making a huge impact, um, and a lot of our work too. Uh, goes into developing astronomy across Africa. So uh, we train students from across Africa who can then return to their home institutes and um, uh, and then they can, you know, set up astronomy uh, institutes and, and courses at, uh, at their, in their own countries and their home countries. Um, and we have various examples of this. It's been a very, very successful project. Um, we we um, we also uh, like to talk about the, uh, the the other impacts of astronomy. Um, we are necessarily at the at the boundary of of what is technologically possible. Um, things like CCDs, uh, which are the the the, light, the sensors in your cell phone camera or in any camera these days, were developed for astronomy um, because we are trying to collect the most light. Um, we also are dealing with uh, the most data, uh, although I think that computing these days uh, in terms of the internet is catching catching up fast. Um, but things like the square kilometer array will be producing the equivalent of, of the global internet traffic every day. Um, so, you know, we, we, we do deal with big data problems. Um, and that means that the people who are trained in astronomy have incredible skills um, and and training which are uh, transferred into uh, the the rest of the community so uh, we we do have many astronomers who move into private industry um, in various fields you know ranging from finance to data science um, and and all of these skills and, and career pathways are are encouraged um, so you know, I think astronomy is a, an excellent tool for getting people well trained and into science, uh, and then, of course, the 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 benefits for the community and um, and the world in general um, follow on from that. Um, it also generates a huge number of of opportunities for socioeconomic development um, in Sutherland, which is a very very small town in the Northern Cape. We now get over fifteen thousand visitors per year. Uh, Fifty years ago, when the observatory was set up. Um, it was just a sheep farming town and they, they got zero visitors per year. Uh, so there are a range of hotels and um, guest guest houses and restaurants and things which have been set up around that. Um, and then, of course, the development of the infrastructure, the roads getting tarred, um, internet arriving um, and those sorts of things which which uh, the astronomy, uh, the astronomical observatory is pushing. Um, and then, of course, uh, creating a platform for for education and awareness, as I said, the you know astronomy represents an excellent opportunity for us to to communicate science to people. It's very exciting, um, and uh, it's a great way to engage people. Um, and then uh, you know this this does lead to economic growth, which is which is very very important, um, and uh, a, a great way um, for us to to make a an impact on the development of of uh, you know. Uh, sustainable development uh, in the world. Um, so uh, I will answer the questions in a moment. 
Um, but if you do want to find out more about the work we do at the observatory uh, or contact me or anything, um, you're welcome to visit our website. It's just saao.ac.za. Um, and uh, the, the emails uh, will come through to me. If you want to contact me directly, um, otherwise visit our website. We've got a wonderful virtual tour um, of our observatory up in, in Sutherland, and you can take a, a scroll through that and visit the inside of all the little telescopes, including SALT, um, and you can sort of travel it your, yourself. Um, so I do encourage you to, to visit the website and, and take yourself through the, the, the virtual tour. Um, so um, I've got a, a few questions here, which I will um, which I will read out and then and then attempt to answer. Um, so uh, the first one is: What technological advancements have had the biggest impact on astronomical observations in the last decade? Um, so you know, I think that probably the the, the answer would be uh, data science. Uh, and actually, in particular, artificial intelligence. So astronomers have been working in machine learning uh, for a, a very long time, um, given the amount of data we have uh, and the need for, for, for processing it um, and the need to query it in, in novel ways. Um, so this has only sort of moved into uh, the public sphere in the last few years. Uh, but something that astronomers have had to work on in, in a very long time for a very long time. But I think that the the public engagement and the amount of energy that's going into it now and, and capital uh, that's going into the development of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, is having and will continue to have a huge impact on astronomy too because uh, the, the rate of development is so high. Um, we now have uh, GPUs and things which are, are getting developed um, much quicker, which we can use uh, to, to uh, upgrade our, our, our data services. Um, but then also I mentioned already like the, the robotic telescopes and the remote observing capabilities. Um, we have a vision over the next uh, five or 10 years for all of those telescopes on site to actually be linked uh, in something we call the intelligent observatory. Uh, and some of the telescopes are, are already linked. Um, so then you'll get one of these telescopes who is observing the night sky um, and he detect something it doesn't even have to be here in, in, in South Africa it can be anywhere in the world um, if they detect something of interest that can send an automated trigger uh, to another telescope and say hey I've spotted something um, and then that telescope goes and has a look at it um, it can process it itself um, and determine if it is interesting um, and if it is very interesting then it can upgrade it or escalate it to uh, another telescope you know um, all the way up until salt so uh, if there are, if there's a, an exploding star or something which is very, very interesting, we can have multiple telescopes observing it within minutes um, around the world uh, without any human intervention. So, uh, you know, these are, these are software advancement advances and technological advancements which are which are making astronomy, um, you know, quite exciting. And um, um, the next question is, what are the biggest challenges facing observational astronomy today? Uh, I think uh, there are a few, obviously. Um, you know, uh, funding is, is always uh, hard to, to come by, but uh, I think that um, there are a lot of exciting things we can do. But, but one of the really big ones at the moment is, uh, is light pollution. Um, so the, the telescopes, uh, like, you know, in Sutherland, are, are, we try and put them far away from, from people, but the light pollution is still a, a major problem. You know, Cape Town is 250 kilometers as the crow flies. Uh, from Sutherland, uh, but on a dark night, once you've been there and your eyes have adapted, uh, you can still see the glow on the horizon from, from 250 kilometers away. Um, and this is a problem for, for observatories around the world. Uh, and then more recently, uh, satellites in space. So for ground-based observatories, uh, we have satellites passing over constantly. Uh, and now with the satellite constellations providing internet, such as Starlink, um, they are, you know, there are tens of thousands of satellites passing. So if you're doing a long exposure um, on an object, you will definitely get some satellites passing through your through your instrument, um, through your image, which you then have to to delete that data and, and clean. Um, and that is a problem which I think is only going to get worse. Um, and uh, that's a big problem for ground-based uh, observational astronomy. 
Um, are there any recent breakthroughs in astronomy that you find particularly exciting? Well, not that I can tell you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so I think that the the, the breakthroughs um, are, are coming thick and fast. I think that um, there is a, you know a huge amount that uh, is is going on in many many different fields, um, and the, the there are definitely some very exciting things happening and some exciting things coming. Um, I think things like Meerkat and the and the SKA will will make some really groundbreaking discoveries in the in the next few years, um, and I think that those will be very exciting. Um, let me just uh, type um, something here because one of the things which I forgot to include in my slide um, is that we actually have a, a, a podcast, um, if you're interested in podcasts, called uh, The Cosmic Savannah. Um, so it's thecosmicsavannah.com, um, or you can find us on any of your of your podcasting platforms. Um, uh, and uh, on there, we, we discuss uh, African astronomy and the developments and, and various things about that, um, and some of the you know the the recent discoveries and things so if you want to to go have a look at the cosmic savannah um you can and and yeah let us know if you have any questions there too um uh, next next question um for students interested in astronomy um can can you recommend any resources or online or books that would be beneficial? Oh, I'd recommend the Cosmic Savannah podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I think that there are, there's a there's a huge amount available online, and it is definitely hard uh, to trawl through. Um, I don't have I don't have a, a, a list readily available, but um, there are some some really nice online courses through uh, Coursera. Um, uh, perhaps that's one which I can follow up um, with an email. Um, if you want to contact me um, through the website. Um, the next one is, do you think we may one day find signs of intelligent life in other galaxies? I love this question. Um, so as I mentioned right at the beginning, we've got about 2 trillion galaxies. Each of those has got, you know, between 2 and 200 billion stars. Uh, over the last 20 years, we've been identifying um, and discovering planets around other stars. Uh, and on average, we find about one planet for every star. So if we talk about 100 billion stars and 2 trillion galaxies, and each of those has a planet, uh, I think that the, the odds of life uh, forming and evolving only on one planet uh, in the last 13 billion years um, are very, very small. Uh, but unfortunately, given the scale of the universe and that same number, which I just um, threw out, we will not ever <laughs> be able to to reach those sorts of distances. Um, the universe is so big, um, our nearest star is four light years away, um, which means it'll take us four years to send a message there and then four years for one to come back. So eight years just to send something and receive it. Um, traveling for light years is is not possible, um, which means that we're we're confined to a very small sphere of, of influence and exploration. Uh, so so interacting with intelligent life, even though um, it, it may be out there, um, I don't know how intelligent it would be or not, but um, would be very very difficult. I think that the most likely occurrence and maybe something which will happen in our lifetimes is that we will get pretty good evidence. Um, of uh, the of of life in the atmosphere of another planet, so a planet around another star. Um, we have telescopes such as the James Webb Space Telescope that can look inside the atmosphere for various molecules and gases and things. Um, and there's a chance that we find in in those atmospheres signs of life. Um, so elements or, or molecules which can only have been formed by life um, then but th then I think that's probably the closest we will get uh, at least in the, in the foreseeable future um, I don't know how much time we have I think Amon will, will pop in uh, when when time's up but there's one other question here um, how do you determine the distance to other stars uh, excellent question too 
So um, I mentioned that at the, the Southern African, uh, the South African Astronomical Observatory, we measured the distance to uh, a star for the first time. Um, and the way we did that was with parallax. Um, and parallax, um, you can do it in your in your hall or wherever you are right now. Um, you can hold your finger out in front of your in front of your face, look at your finger, um, and take notice of the background, um, and then close one eye, and then flip to the other eye, and you'll see your finger moving like this relative to the background. So we can do that with stars. We have a look at the the stars, um, a map of the stars, you know, a photograph of the stars um, in a certain area of the sky. Uh, and then six months later, when the Earth is on the other side of the sun, so we've moved quite far, you know, that's the distance between our eyes uh, in this case. So you've moved from that side to that side. Um, you can see some of the stars, the closer ones, will have moved very slightly compared to the background. Um, and now you have that distance. So in this case, the distance between my eyes, you have um, how much the finger has moved. And you can work out using trigonometry uh, the length of your arm. Uh, so that's what we do with stars. So we know the distance, um, twice the distance of the Earth to the sun. Um, that's the, the baseline. And we know the angle. And that's how we work out the distance to, to nearby stars, at least. Um, for more distant stars, there are other ways we can do it. Um, there are various uh, standard candles uh, that we we have calibrated based on on pulsating stars and things, but but that's the simplest way um, is parallax. All right, I think that um, I've noticed all of the the questions so far. Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much all of the questions, uh, Daniel. So I think it's just time to just wrap things up. So I just like to. Thank yourself for such an exciting uh, talk. I love the images as well. They look absolutely fantastic. And just like to thank the attendees for their amazing questions as well. Thank you. Uh, and just to remind you that this session is actually recorded and it will be available uh, in the next coming week on the Nerve Centre's YouTube site. So if any of your students have actually missed the presentations through the absence or whatever, they can come and look in at a later date. So. All of that is, uh, will become available from mid next week. So we just keep an eye out for that. So just, Daniel, thank you very much again. I uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you. And just to say bye-bye to all of our participants. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.